for the debate. The uh, search for this week is organizing activities every afternoon from midday onwards. Today it's going to be a debate. Uh, the title will be Life is Better Without Belief in God. And we have two speakers, for and against. Uh, we have Dr. Michael Green from Oxford University. Uh, and also we'll, from the humanities, we have um, Ramon Kassar, who will be speaking in this debate. Um, I hope you will enjoy, and they will have 12 minutes each for to start with. Then we have question time from the floor, and then they will have five minutes each to close up. Um, Ramon Kassar will be starting, okay? <laughs> Um, okay, first of all, it's Ramon Asa, and uh, I am from the Humanist uh, Association of Malta. Um, I'm glad to thank the Malta University Bible Group for this invitation. It's a very interesting debate. And to Michael be here for joining us today, as well as to all of you for attending. Um, I, I would like to point out, initially the debate was going to be called Life is Better Without God. And I asked for the change because uh, it's, the question seems to assume that God exists and you're either on his side or you're not. Which is of course not my position. I, I'm a, an atheist, I do not believe in God, so that question would not have made much sense for me. Um, so either God exists, whether we believe in him or not, or God does not exist, whether we believe in him or not. So the real question is, whether you believe or not, and whether that uh, makes you live a better life. Um, we are immediately faced with something of a problem. What makes a better life? By whose standards? A hedonist might consider a better life as one which gives him the most uh, material pleasures. An altruist might consider an ideal life as one which helps others. Some theists might favor one which is dedicated to their religion, whatever that entails. There is no universal definition of a, uh, an ideal life. However, let's, let, let's set aside this question for now. We'll come back to it later. Does belief in God, in God or its absence make life better? How does belief in God change a person's life? History from, from ancient to recent shows us many examples of people whose actions were greatly affected by their beliefs. This effect, however, has not always been good. Physicist and Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg said of religion, with or without it, you would have good people doing good things and evil people doing evil things. But for good people to do evil things, that takes religion. We have extreme cases. We have suicide bombers who are explicitly inspired by their beliefs to do what they do. And we have less extreme cases, such as latent homophobia that is found in many belief systems. There are, of course, people who are either violent or homophobic independently of religion. However, I also know personally people who are kind, gentle, altruistic, and yet, if the topic of gay rights comes up, it's as if something changes. A switch goes off. They can't name a single civil right that they want to deny to same-sex couples, but they don't want them to marry anyway. The, re the only reason they have is that, according to their belief, God doesn't want this. Similarly, for millennia, women were accorded fewer rights than men, and equality has not yet been achieved. This is often justified by religion. <laughs> Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all have a history of oppressing women, and in some places this still happens. In many cases, the reason for this is that people believe that certain things are demanded by God, and therefore we should not question them. God is supreme. This is where religion differs from just about everything else. In science, in philosophy, even in politics, you can change your mind relatively easily. In politics, we have, in Malta, we had a party which was explicitly against joining the EU, a change in leader, and now we have a party that is in favor of being in the EU. And similarly, on the other side, we had a party which was very much confessional and religious, and with a change in leader, now it is less so. In, re in religion, People are still opposing homosexuality because someone more than 3,000 years ago declared that God doesn't want it. 
So what if there was no religion? Sure, there would still be homophobic people, but there would be fewer. Those who are only homophobic because they believe their religion requires them to be wouldn't. How much easier would it be to reduce the spread of AIDS if the Catholic Church did not preach against the use of condoms? How much better would education in the USA be if there wasn't a multi-million dollar lobby undermining it to try to get creationism taught in state schools as a science? How much better would women be around the world if the Quran and the Bible did not say that men are superior? In Malta, how many people had to live a lie for decades until divorce was introduced, and the reason it wasn't introduced until recently was because of opposition due to religious, religious reasons? And yet, I hear you say, many religious people do good things too. And this is true. But I believe that it is in the nature of most people to do good. I don't think that people do good only because they believe they'll be rewarded for it. They do it because it's the right thing to do. Religion, churches, provide the organization, the infrastructure for many charitable acts. But the charity happens because people care. It's a human thing. It's a product of our evolution that allows us to live as, as communities. Without religion, it would still happen. Maybe it, they might be a bit better because they would build more schools than churches. It is worth noting that countries that have a high percentage of atheists, together with modern democracy, seem to do very well in caring for their poor, not to mention having high standards of living. So, do we live a better life without belief in God? I am a humanist, and as such I believe in individual rights, in freedoms combined with responsibility and social cooperation. I believe that people can and will continue to find solutions to the world's problems so that quality of life can be improved for everyone. I believe that a life without a religious belief is the best way to achieve this, because we are not shackled by the requirements that we have to restrict ourselves to what a certain scripture says or what a certain church leader says. In conclusion, yes, I believe we do have a better life without a belief in God. Thank you. Now we have Dr. Michael Green, who will speak against the premise. Dr. Michael Green. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to come to Malta. It's not my first visit, and I'm thrilled to be here. Now, life is better without belief in God. It's a very fashionable idea these days. Even if you don't go as far as Christopher Hitchens, religion poisons everything, you may agree that the case for humanism is um, attractive. It's got real merit, and that life may well be better without belief in God. But I remain just a little bit uneasy about two words in the topic under discussion. Uh, one is better, and the other is God. Let's take the God word first. We can easily assume that we all know what we mean by God, but do we? What sort of God are we talking about? The God who is a heartless tyrant? The God who forces people to obey him? The God who authorizes the slaughter of innocent people in Nairobi or Peshawar in very recent days? The God who is a human being claiming absolute power, like uh, Stalin or Mao Zedong? The God who always backs our eyes against the other guy's eyes. The God who pats us on the head and says, there, there, uh, you can do what you like, I don't mind. The God who started the cosmos off and then sat back and had no more to do. Well, the very contemporary God of sex and power, people have worshipped all these ideas of God. Let's throw them up. We're far better off without any religious belief at all. It's a very attractive position. But hang on, um, what about the origin of life and the universe? There are, I think, basically four questions you can ask, big questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why are there living things rather than just dead matter? Why are there complex living things and not just liquids? And why are there conscious, thinking creatures, you and me, who bother to ask questions like that? Ah, you may say. Easy to answer that. Evolution. 
But evolution doesn't answer all those questions. In fact, it only answers number three. Why are there complex living organisms, not just amoebas? It has nothing to say to the question, why is there anything at all? Oh, yes, it has, you say? The Big Bang. Ah, what made it go bang? And why was it so big? The universe seems to have sprung from something very powerful outside of space and time. And incidentally, that chimes in with what the Bible has to say about God. Eternal, uncaused, powerful, loving, and outside of space and time. Just suppose for a moment, just suppose that you were that sort of God. What might you do to show your hand to men and women who had said, I don't want anything to do with you. Well, you might start by creating a marvelous world and shout it out with the beauty and skill and power of the Creator. God has done that. You might create people um, capable of love, people with the dangerous gift of free will who could either respond to you or reject you. God has done that too. You can then go on to instill into the hearts of people um, values which spoke of you, values like beauty and truth and creativity and goodness and speech and love. Wherever these are found, they would point to the Creator and His nature. They would be footmarks of God in the sand of our lives. Well, God has done that too. You might like the idea of building in a conscience which would approve when people chose the right way and would prod them and warn them when they chose the wrong way and went astray. God has done that as well. You could instill a God-shaped blank in their hearts, a hole which nothing else could fill apart from the living God himself, a space which cries out for satisfaction and fulfillment despite all the rubbish that we pile into it. Well, God has done that as well. And finally, you might conceivably come to this world in person. You'd have to come as one of them, of course, because if you disclosed yourself in all your radiant beauty, they would be blinded by the sight. It would be very costly. You'd have to love them an awful lot if you were going to shrink them yourself down to their level. It would be an almost unthinkable sacrifice. And yet, that is what the God I worship has done. The historical evidence for Jesus, God's coming into the world, is compelling. His quality of life shows what God is like. Radical, loving, holy, generous, forgiving, vibrant, winsome. We're no longer ignorant of the ideal for human life because the ideal has lived. And his name is Jesus. How could life be better? if we turn our backs on him. Well, remember, we're going to look at two words uh, in uh, our motion. I've said enough uh, about God, um, to show you what I mean by him, not an absentee despot, but the managing director who loves us enough to come down to the shop floor and get his hands not only dirty, but pierced. He's come to show us what life at its best could be like. And it's an immensely attractive picture. I would encourage you to grab one of the free copies of the Gospel um, in Maltese and uh, hanging around around the, around the place and just read the story of Jesus for yourself. But it's time to look at the other word in the notion, better. Do we mean that it's intellectually better um, not to believe in God, that it makes more sense? After all, being kind and generous and unselfish and so on uh, can be found in humanists just as much as believers and sometimes more so. So why drag God in? The answer I think is fairly simple. If there is no God, if this world is all there is, then Dostoevsky is surely right in the Brothers Karamazov when he says, is there no God, then everything is permitted. Some humanists are kind and generous. Some are ruthless and corrupt. It is simply a matter of preference. Without God, there is no absolute standard by which we can begin to judge what is good and what is not. Hitler thought it good to liquidate six million Jews. That was his preference. Our preference might be different. 
but there is no standard. It comes down to personal choice. And Richard Dawkins um, admits that, that he draws out the moral implications of unbelief in a blunt but very clear way. I quote, in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, any justice. The universe we observe has precisely those properties we should expect. If there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. Well, Hitler danced to its music. And the 9-11 bombers dance to its music. There is no way we can blame them unless there is an absolute standard by which they can be judged. Surely Dostoevsky was right. If there is no God, then everything is permitted. He wasn't arguing that atheists don't do good things. He knows it, so do I. He was arguing that they do not have an intellectual foundation for morality. But perhaps by better, the motion means uh, morally better, not to believe in God. That would be rather hard to sustain. A vast amount of good is undertaken by believers who hope to gain nothing whatever from it. And they do it at great inconvenience to themselves because, uh, as Reynolds did say, um, they know it's the right thing to do. To be sure, Christians have often been cruel, vicious, and violent, and I'm ashamed to have to say so, but I admit it, honestly. But why did they do it? Because they refused to follow the way of Jesus. You'll never find Jesus sanctioning violence against other people. On the contrary, he accepted violence against himself. Most Christians follow his example. This has been notable in Egypt recently, when Christians refused to retaliate when their pastors were shot and their churches were burnt down. Similarly, in Peshawar, in Pakistan, just a couple of weeks ago, 130 or so Christians were mown down when they were at worship. And the Christians did not retaliate. On the contrary, in recent decades, we've seen the most horrendous violence and misery inflicted by political leaders who rejected God. You only have to mention the names of Hitler with his liquidation of Jews and gypsies and Christians, Stalin who slaughtered some 60 million people, most of them from his own country, Mao Zedong and Pol Pot. These atheist believers have been the main killers in our day. It's very hard to maintain that life is morally better when people don't believe in God. And of course you might see better in a different life. Life is better without belief in God. Could mean not intellectually or morally. It could mean personally better, more fulfilling and satisfying. Does becoming a Christian make me more miserable? It hasn't made me more miserable. And it hasn't made millions and millions of people uh, across the world. Um, the dentist to me listened to an unbeliever, Matthew Paris, who's an ex-MP in Britain and columnist for the London Times. He recently did a return visit to the Africa of his boyhood and he was simply overwhelmed by the liberation that Jesus Christ gives people and the better life that they enjoy. Christians, he writes, were always different. Their faith liberated and relaxed them. There was a liveliness, a curiosity, an engagement with the world, a directness in dealing with other people that <coughs> seemed to be missing in traditional African life. They stood tall. Wherever we entered the territory worked by missionaries, we had to acknowledge that something changed in the faces of the people, something in their eyes, something in the way they approached you, direct, man to man, without looking away. They were liberated. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ does set people free. And life is better, not only for Africans, but for us when we put our life in his hands. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have question time. So we have a doctor in this. Okay. Thank you. Um, 
I, I, I certainly agree that a person can ex a, a, a person can experience something that changes their life for the better. Personally, my experience has been the other way around. I was raised from a very young uh, age as a Christian, and I feel, I feel that I am better now that I am an atheist. Uh, but obviously, different people can have different experiences. In your case, you were living in a communist country, possibly you had a number of privileges, a number of problems that made your life more difficult. And at the same time as changing towards Christianity, you also got more freedoms in your own, in your own life. That is one possible reason. But anything can cause a person's life to be better. A person can read a book. It doesn't have to be a religious book. It can be a book that affects them so profoundly, or see a film that affects them so profoundly that their life becomes better as a result. I've known people who, uh, whose lives were changed for the better through music. So any, anything can affect the individual in a different way. And uh, it could be that, yes, Christianity has made your life better. And it could be that uh, some, for somebody else, it's not made your life better from Christianity. I, I know people who said that. They were Christians, they became Muslims, and they said that now I feel better. Now, I, I, feel, I feel better as an atheist because it's as if certain restrictions, certain shackles were removed from me, and I had the freedom to intellectually pursue what I feel to be the best way forward without having to deal with what the Bible says, what the Quran says, what the Vedas say, uh, but to, to use my own intellect to move forward uh, in the way I feel best. But yes, I, I certainly agree that on an individual basis, different people will have, uh, have different things that make their life because so far, I've been asked by a man. Mr. Gawain wants to ask a short question. It has been very short. This lady here. You. Hi, I'll uh, try and shorten it a bit. Um, with regards to religion being good for the world, um, I have many aspects to bring up, but perhaps the one most obvious to me, living in a Christian, heavily Christian environment, is, is it really healthy to tell people that they are sinful, they need the divine to be pure? To tell children that, to need them to be baptized, you know? Um, it seems rather cruel. And speaking on just, I mean, I'm from psychology, I can imagine, you know, telling a child constantly, you know, you are the bad thing, you need to improve, God is perfect. Even though technically God himself committed mass genocide, you know, in the Bible. Um, perhaps, sorry, another short point, why Christianity, why the Christian God? I have no time whatever for telling children that they are bad repeatedly. And in fact, when children are nourished in loving, generous homes, they generally grow up into loving, generous people. Uh, I would go further. I would say I have no time for religion. Religion can be absolutely disastrous. Uh, Jesus Christ came to destroy religion. Religion is like a set of steps to try and climb up to the divine. When Jesus came and kicked those steps away and said it cannot be done, the only hope is a rope through the ceiling and somebody swinging down to show you what is up there. And that, I believe, is what has happened. So much for that question. We need to move on, I guess, now to the conclusion. We'll have closing round of, question, of um, speakers. Uh, now, Michael Green, Dr. Michael Green will start. We'll have five minutes, and then Ramon will have the reply. Okay? And concluding comments from there. Michael. This is going to be continuing every day this week. Um, short talk on the advertising topic and Wednesday for instance we'll pick up uh, earthquakes and volcanoes um, so there'll be a
chance every day to come here and you see there's characters in blue shirts with the thing called the search on them. There we are, there's one of them over there. There's one of them up here. Um, they've been people who they're committed Christians, they've been very happy to pick up questions. Um, and I see there's lots of unanswered questions today. Um, grab a blue shirt and go talk to it. Now my conclusion is this, that we've done a fair amount of arguing about whether or not it's better to believe in God. I want to end, not with an argument, but with three examples of people I know personally. One is Chuck Colson, once a profound skeptic, a gifted but very unpleasant lawyer, who rose to become special counsel to President Nixon. He was utterly ruthless and self-centered. One night he had supper with Tom Phillips, a friend who challenged him about his lifestyle and about his skepticism. You look a bit skeptical. Can I do anything for you? <laughs> it's all happy now. Okay, good. Skepticism satisfied. Great. The surge was coming up up the avenue. Anyhow, this guy had supper with um, Tom Phillips, who challenged him about his lifestyle and gave him a slim book to read. It was called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And it led him to Christ. Shortly afterwards, the Watergate scandal erupted. He was involved in it, pleaded guilty, he went to prison where his Christian faith blossomed. When he came out, he began a life's work of such significance that he is arguably the most effective social reformer of the 20th century. He founded the Prison Fellowship, which is the most compassionate outreach to prisoners in the world, and now works in more than a hundred countries. I once spoke to a conference that he ran for his meeting leaders, almost all of whom had previously been prisoners, some of them actually rescued from death row, such as the American system. Um, and, um, all of them had had their lives turned round by Jesus Christ. And the joy and the confidence in God, which I saw in this group of over a thousand men at the conference, is something that's with me still. There is no doubt that they, like Chuck Wilson himself, have found life infinitely better than the The gospel changes lives in the way in which religion doesn't. And the lives of countless thousands who continue to meet Christ through their ministry are still being changed by prison fellowship. The second person I read to you is a man called Tom Tarrant. He too is a skeptic, he's an anti Semite, he was a terrorist. He was full of violence and hatred. He was profoundly opposed to um, desegregation in the American South in the 60s. By the age of 21, he was a fully fledged member of the Ku Klux Klan, actually in the White Knights, which were the most dangerous wing of the Klan. He took part in some 30 bombings of churches, synagogues, and homes. He was captured in a shootout of the FBI police, in which his partner was killed, and he himself almost died after having been bullets. He was sentenced to 30 years in one of the roughest prisons in the state. With limited reading material available, he began to examine the Gospels. He was haunted by the words of Jesus, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And alone in his cell, he entrusted his broken life to Christ and the transformation was very soon apparent. He renounced his membership of the clan and his deep-seated characteristic of hatred changed into one of gentleness and love. He's actually one of the most gracious and gentle men that I know. After release from prison, he trained for Christian ministry. He was ordained and he devoted himself to Christian social work, particularly among the poor blacks in Washington, D.C. I think you find it very hard to persuade him that life is better when you don't believe in God. And the third person I bring you is Jackie Pollinger, a very ordinary young woman, until she discovered the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. Fresh out of music college, she wanted to be a missionary, but none of the societies would take her. Eventually, at the age of 22,
two, she gathered together her savings and bought a one-way boat ticket, hilariously, without knowing quite where she was going to go. But it would be as far as her finances allowed her to travel. And that turned out to be Hong Kong, where she knew nobody and she had no resources. So she started to teach music and to care for the desolate young people around her. Soon, her attention was drawn to the walled city, six acres and a half of Kowloon, which was densely populated and was controlled by criminal gangs, particularly the much feared Triad. Even the police did not dare to enter the walled city, except when they carried out raids in large groups. And many such raids took place. Uh, 2,500 criminals were arrested over the years, and over 40,000 tons of drugs. But nothing changed in the criminal nature of the walled city. It was a terrible place, full of human trafficking, prostitution, money laundering, counterfeiting, contract killings, massive drug dealing and murder. And Jackie Pullinger sailed courageously into this hell unaccompanied. And she showed her care for the residents by countless acts of kindness. Once they realized that she was there to stay, they began to open up to her. Addicts discovered that they could come off heroin cold turkey when concentrated prayer was made for them. Criminals of all sorts came to faith. The Hong Kong government was highly impressed and gave her a building where recovering gang members, members and prostitutes and drug addicts were rehabilitated. Not with medicine, but cold turkey accompanied by intense prayer offered by ex-addicts. By 2007, it was caring for 200 inmates and several thousand addicts have been set free and uh, she continues to live out in Hong Kong. The walled city, ladies and gentlemen, is no more. Its walls have been taken down. The lives of its inhabitants have been changed and now it is a pleasant part. Jackie Pullinger is one of the most famous missionaries in the world and one of the most unassuming. But I can assure you that if she was here today, she would want you to know that life is by no means better without belief in God. It is that belief which has utterly transformed one of the most evil places in the world. If you really think that life is better without belief in God, I would suggest you get on an airplane and fly to North Korea. Very atheistic and not very happy. That would be my suggestion. Thank you. year one or year two at school, I must have been around six years old, I think, I had my first doubt in religion. The teacher had just told us a very simple I and mean, common belief in Christianity, you have to be a Christian to go to heaven. And I was shocked. I was shocked because a few months earlier, I had been collecting big beans and other things of as we sent to Ethiopia in those days, to people who had never heard about Jesus. And I expected, I, I said, oh, so those kids that we found no kids for are going to hell? And I knew it was wrong. The teacher asked someone and said, no, no, they won't go to hell, they'll go to limbo. Because that was still in the Catholic uh, teachings in those days. And that did shut me up, but it didn't satisfy me. I knew it was still wrong. I knew it was wrong that I should go to heaven because I happened to be born in Malta. And those guys who happened to be born in hunger and thirst and disease and so on would live a very short life and then not get better than I was given. Because they deserved better than I did. I knew it at the age. And I think that was one of the, it was the first time that I had ever challenged what I had been, uh, what was being taught. I didn't become an atheist there and then, but throughout the years I had many more doubts about things that the Bible tells us, and um, which we are required to accept the very simple. Why did God punish the first one? The Pharaoh, I have the same problem with you. That's a problem. Or why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Weren't there any children there who were innocent? 
any women. I mean, okay, there were this group of people who were about to invade the ages. They deserve punishment, but not all of the others. Why did they have to, to die? When they were leaving uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, Lot's wife turned back to, to, look, to look at you know, her neighbors, her friends, who were screaming as they were being burned alive, and she got turned into a door of salt. How is that moral? What kind of morality is, is being taught by these stories? Even if you go to the New Testament, where, which is a great improvement because even Jesus realized that these things were in the Old Testament were not quite right and tried to change them. He who has no sin cast the first stone. He was trying to change them, right? But even from then until today, things have changed further. In the in the New Testament, we have St. Paul telling slaves, obey your masters as if you were obeying God. What kind of moral teaching is that? And this is in the New Testament. Jesus may not have been a violent person, but he did tell his followers to sell their clothes and buy swords. He did say, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. He said he came to, to set uh, children against their parents and against each other. So, as I see it, the Bible is just a thick book in which you can find verses to support any position you care to, to have. If you want to be violent, the Bible is full of violence. You can use, look, God says this, this prophet says that. If you want to be a good person, the Bible also has good verses. But how do we decide which are the good verses and which aren't? We do decide because many of these stories you will not hear in churches. You will not hear in the, in the, uh, in the Sunday Mass about how Jesus cursed a, a fig tree. What has he got, what has he got a fig against things? You won't hear about it because someone decided this is not really a good story to be teaching people. And if humans are deciding from the Bible which are the good bits and which are the bad bits, then it is humans who are the source of morality and not the Bible. The Bible just provides verses so that you can say, God said this, it has the authority of God, but we are the source of morality and as I forgot, I forgot the name of this, this Greek uh, philosopher. Before Jesus, he said, man is the measure of all things. Thank you. I would like to thank both speakers, Ramon and uh, also Michael. It was interesting, interesting for me. I hope it was interesting also for you all. And there were really good uh, contributions to knowledge you might want to discuss further with some of our members of the team or with the speakers themselves later on. And I would like to remind you that this is not over. We have a week of activities going on. This is um, the first day, Monday, tomorrow, same time, up until the end of the week, Friday. We, we will always have activities from midday till one. Tomorrow, yes, Michael Green will uh, speak about um, God limiting our sex life and pleasures. This will be an interesting talk from midday onwards. And in the evening, today, there will be activity, another activity. Um, I believe it's music, right, Jeff? At 8 p.m. in the evening, there will be a number of bands and artists playing some of their own music as well. So it will be a good time for you to enjoy music with us and fellowship. Uh, Ramon, you wanted to comment? I just, want, I just wanted to say uh, the Motor Humanist Association is uh, planning to set up a university branch uh, for humanists. Uh, we work here in Fresher Street, from what I understand, but uh, we are planning on uh, having a meeting pretty soon uh, on campus to set up this organization. Those who are interested, uh, the best way to get hold of us is either on our website, motorhumanist.org, or seek us out on Facebook, Motor Humanist Association. And we we'll keep you informed about what the university group speaks about. Happy day. If you want to stick around to talk, please do so. We have people in blue shirts who would love to talk to you.